If you have your Bibles, go with me to 2 Kings, the 13th chapter. And while you're turning there, I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, as we gather together tonight and rally, Lord. God, tonight is a night of encouragement. Lord, equip us to do the work of the ministry this season that's coming up. God, may this not be something that only starts at Easter. May it continue on throughout our lifetime. Father, I pray that you plant seeds tonight, God, that bear fruit on into eternity. Lord, we want to see the glory of God. We want to see a move of your spirit in this place, God. And so, Lord, you said to ask for the nations. And so, God, we ask. Lord, there are many nations represented in the Inland Empire, many people surrounding us. God, we ask for each and every one. May this church continue to be forever, God, until Jesus comes, a multicultural, multi-generational church, loving people to life, taking care of business for the kingdom of God, winning souls for forever, God. We thank you, Lord, that you're going to move in this place God, you're going to do more than we could even ask or think because you are the God of super abundant above all that we could ask or think. And so, Lord, we give you praise tonight as we open up your word that you open it up to us. Speak to us tonight, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody in agreement said, amen. Amen. Tonight I have a short just exhortation for you from 2 Kings, the 13th chapter. Here in 2 Kings chapter 13, we're going to read verse number 14 through verse number 19. 2 Kings, the 13th chapter, verse number 14 says this, Elijah had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Elisha was the great prophet that succeeded Elijah. Okay, Elisha was the one who did double the miracles of Elijah. And so here he is becoming sick with the illness with which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Now, I want you to notice something. He came in saying the right thing, my father, my father. But then we find out what's really on his heart is that it's not about Elisha leaving. It's not about the relationship that he had with the man of God. But rather, this is about the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. He is concerned that if Elisha goes on into eternity to be with the Lord, if he dies, then no longer is Israel going to have the strength that they used to have. And so he weeps over the face of Elisha. Now, remember, every king of Israel recorded in the Bible was wicked. Their hearts turned away from God, and they did not serve God. So we know that this is a man who did not serve God wholly. This is a man who liked the idea of having the prophet and having the presence of God and having the blessings of God, but didn't want to serve God wholehearted. And so here he weeps over the prophet, not because of his relationship with God, not because of the relationship with the prophet. No, because of the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And so he goes on and it says in the next verse, verse number 15, Elijah said to him, take a bow and some arrows. And so he took himself a bow and some arrows. I believe that Elijah is doing something prophetically here. He is saying, this is not time to cry. This is not time to sit down and blubber over what you used to have that you don't think that you're going to have any longer. This is a time to get up and do something. And that in my death, I will impart something to you that you're going to be able to carry throughout your lifetime. Listen, church, we may look at this church. We may look at the Inland Empire. We may look at society, and we we may want to sit down and cry. Why? Because it's not easy to have church anymore. You know, we're in a post-Christian generation, and, and things are going down the toilet so fast that it's hard to keep up. Social media and all this kind of filth that's on the Internet, the stuff that's on TV, they're using language that they didn't have used to you, use. Uh, things are being exposed explain to children that we never had to deal with in our generation. And listen, I'm a young man, but I'm having to explain things to my kids a whole lot earlier than they were explained to me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And it would be easy to sit down and cry and say, God, oh God, what's going on? It's not that easy to do church. People don't just show up because it's Sunday anymore. And yet, tonight, I want to encourage you that this is not the time as the church to sit down and have a good cry. This is not time to bellyache, ball and squall to God and say, God, I don't just, uh, I know it's not easy, God, and I don't know what to do anymore, and people don't want to serve you. No, God says, get up and get a bow. It's time to get to war. It's time to fight. It's time to get in it, and it's time to win. I wonder, do I have any winners in the house tonight? If you really want to win, I want to hear you say it. Say, I want to win. Oh, come on, somebody. Say, I want to win. Shout it like you're mad. Say, I want to win. win. See, there has to be an attitude that comes out of a winner. Has to be something that comes out of us. And so he says, go and get a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Verse 16, then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it. Elijah put his hands on the king's hands. Listen, church, 
When you start to grab a hold of what God tells you to do, when you walk in obedience, the hand of God rests upon your life. God wants to get his hand on you. God wants to touch you. God wants to bless you. God wants to anoint you because God has an appointment for your life. God has plans. God has grace. God has favor. God has something that's going to go on in your life. Once you get your hand on it, God will get his hand on you. Am I talking to anybody tonight? So it goes on in verse number 17, and he said, open the east window, and he opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek until you have destroyed them. Verse 18, then he said, take the arrows. So he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. We've all heard of great sports teams that because of their unity, because of their ability, maybe because of their coaching, that they won. They had something that, that was an X factor. Maybe there was a, a, a single person that was an all-star and they rallied around that person and they won. They did great feats. Maybe it was a Tom Brady. Maybe it was a Michael Jordan. Maybe it was, uh, you know, Michael Phelps and the Olympic swim team. We've all heard of these teams. We've heard of the greats. We've heard of the legends of these, these, these great men and women who have done great deeds physically here on the earth. But I would imagine that if we went and we started to interview these great individuals and these great teams, and we started to take a look at what, what really was it, what's the, the common denominator, because not all of them had great coaches, not all of them had an all-star, not all of them had the same unity, but all of them, I would imagine, would have one thing, and that was a desire on the inside that was greater than the opposition that came against them that they wanted to win, because they had to have it in them. I know that there are sports teams on the earth that weren't the greatest, they weren't the most skilled, they weren't the best, they didn't have the greatest coaching, but they had a desire that was greater than the teams around them, and they said, we're not giving up, we're not letting up, we're not going to quit, we're not going to sit down and cry, we're going to fight till the end, and they won because they had it on the inside. And I believe that as a church, we have to get that attitude that we're going to win at Easter. Oh, come on, somebody. We're going to win at Easter. This is not a losing season for us. If, if ever there was a, a big day, if ever there was a big time for us as the church, it is Easter time. The world is watching and the world is waiting and people's minds and eyes are on Jesus right now. And this is our time to shine. This is not a time to sit down and cry and wonder why people aren't coming to church. No, I want to win. And therefore, we're going to go out and we're going to get them. We're going to invite them. We're going to love them. And we're going to preach the gospel to them and they're going to get saved, and we're going to win souls for the kingdom of God. But you got to want it. you got to want it. Stop crying and do something. Because victory is a choice. Victory is a choice. We need to have on the inside of us the determination that not only do I want to win, but I'm going to win. Why? Because Jesus is the victor. And now we are in Christ Jesus. And therefore, if I'm inside of Christ, then I'm already a winner. It's just a matter of going and gathering up the results. And therefore, we cannot lose. We cannot fail when you step out with the anointing of God. If God's hand is on your life, you cannot help but win. And therefore, we need to step out in the victory that's already ours. Victory is a choice. We can choose it. We can choose where we want to win. I believe that as a church, we need to choose that we're going to win at Easter. Now, remember I said this message is going to apply to more than just Easter. Maybe some of you guys have been failing in areas of life. Maybe there's been besetting sins that you're wondering why you can't get over. Maybe it's because you haven't made the choice to win yet. Maybe you need to determine, listen, this thing's not going to stop me any longer. This thing will not hold me bound any longer. These chains will be broken off of my life in Jesus' name. I'm going to win and let that winning spirit come out of you. Let the victory of Jesus Christ carry you through to the win. Because, guys, can I tell you something? We are not playing a football game. This is not a basketball game. This is not a swim meet. 
This is a battle. And this is a battle that has already been won at the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, we have to remind the devil, and we have to go out and enforce the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, if you're getting beat up, if you're not winning, if you feel like you're failing at every end, it's time to choose to win. You need to make a choice because victory is a choice and choose where you're going to win. I'm going to win in my marriage. I'm going to win at business. I'm going to win at being a parent. I'm going to win at being a good student. I'm going to win at at not driving my parents crazy. Come on, some children in this place say amen, right? You're going to honor your father and mother. You're going to choose where you're going to win. I'm going to win at relationships. I'm going to win at being a witness and a testimony. I'm going to win as I drive on the freeway, not losing my mind. Am I talking to anybody? You've got to choose it. See, windows need to be opened. We need to get a picture of where we want to win so that we can make the choice. I'm going to win there. See, the, the, the prophet said, I want you to open the window. What is a window? A window is something that gives you a vision. Is that right? See, doors open up, and you can walk through those doors into opportunity, into other places, into different spaces. But a window you cannot walk through. A window you can look through. See, a window is for vision, and that's why he said, I want you to open up the window, and I want you to shoot the arrow, because I need you to see yourself winning at this battle. And so tonight, maybe you've been failing so much that that's all you can see, that's all you can focus on. But God says, I want you to throw open the window. Use your imagination tonight. Get your hand on the bow and get you some arrows. And I want you to open the window. I want you to see your marriage blessed. I want you to see your children raised up in the ways of the Lord. I want you to see yourself serving the Almighty God and succeeding in business. I want you to see yourself at Easter. I need some greeters in this place to see themselves with a big smile on their face welcoming people in. I need the praise and worship team that's in this place to see yourself worshiping and pressing in and God moving while you worship. I need the children's ministry workers to see yourself kneeling down and loving on a child who misses mommy that's over there in the main sanctuary. I need some teen workers to see yourself loving teenagers who don't want it, who are closed off and opposed to it, and yet the love of Jesus is breaking down every wall. I need some SPTs in this place to view yourself discipling and mentoring and raising up people. We got to get a picture of us winning at Easter and in every area of our life. Somebody say, I want to win. You got to get a picture of it. You got to throw open the windows and see it. You got to choose where you're going to win. See, everything under the banner of ministry sounds wonderful, sounds virtuous, but Limitation will force your focus. What do I mean by that? If you can choose, I'm going to win here. I'm going to win here. It will force you to focus on the win. Maybe there's other things that are good, but they're not God. You know, there are many things that we could be doing. Well, I could do one service, and then, you know, I could just crash on the couch. But God says, I want you to focus on the win. I want you to see yourself winning. I want you to see yourself sacrificing. I want you to see yourself fighting. And therefore, the standard has to match the stakes. Guys, we're not playing a game. This is about eternal life. This is about the souls of men and women. And the standard matches the stakes. Thank you guys for showing up on a Sunday night. Thank you guys that when we put the call out to all the volunteers and the members, that you guys showed up. Maybe some of you guys, it was hard to get here tonight. Maybe you guys are tired. Maybe this is your Sunday and you're going, man, I'm going back into the the work week. But listen, the standard has to match the stakes because the eternal life of men and women in the Inland Empire is at stake. The devil is out there working overtime and the church can't show up for service. Thank you guys for showing up. Thank you guys for taking the time. If you're online and you made it important enough to listen to this message online tonight and live stream, thank you guys for showing up tonight online. Because I know it's tough and I know some of you guys have got to rush out of this place and get your children ready for school. you got to get yourself ready for the work week. And it's a sacrifice to be here. Thank you guys for making the sacrifice because the standard has to match the stakes. What's represented here is really what represents the core of our church. Yes, there may be 17,000 people that call the Rock Church and World Outreach Center their home. And yes, at Easter time, we're going to have 15,000 plus. I'm going to say it in faith, and you better believe it with me. We're going to have 20,000 people plus this Easter weekend coming through the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. But right here in this room and whatever's watching online, 
is what represents the core of our church, and the standard has to match the stakes. Guys, if we're going to win the Inland Empire, we can't do it alone. It's going to take all of us doing our part. Yes, the preacher's going to preach. Yes, the band is going to play. Yes, we've, we've got all sorts of things that we're going to be doing, but it is time for the church. And when I say the church, not just the people that are paid by the church, but each and every one of you guys sitting in those seats that are a part of the body of Christ, you are the church. It's time for the church to rise up and to do something because we are going to win. If I could give you a quick formula for victory, it looks like this. Gift times grind equals vi victory. Gift times grind equals victory. In other words, the amount of effort you put in multiplied by your giftedness is what's going to bring you to victory. Sometimes people say, I'm not very talented. Yeah, you may not be very talented. You know what? I am not the greatest preacher. There are definitely preachers out there that are better than I am. And yet, I work hard. I study hard. I pray hard. I stay up. I'm up late. I I'm thinking about my messages. I'm, I I'm pressing myself. I'm getting outside of myself. You know, I'm not the loudest person when you get around me uh, outside of this place. But listen, my, my gift that God has given me, the anointing of God on my life, plus my grind, times my grind, equals the victory that God gives me. It's the same thing in your life. You may not be the smartest. You may not be the most talented. You may not be the best, but if you multiply the gift that God has placed on your life and multiply that times the amount of work that you're willing to put in, God will cause it to be exponentially greater than anything else that anybody ever could do, and he will give you the victory. See, there are churches out there that have greater talent and greater capacity, and yet they're not willing to work like this church is willing to work. We're rolling up our sleeves, we're getting dirty, and we're doing something. And that's why the, the gift, see, you may not be a five-talent person. Maybe you're only two-talent person. But, man, you're going to go out and you're going to grind, right? You're going to go and do something. Lord, here's your two plus two more. Gift times grind. See, the guy that even had one talent, you remember the story? The guy had one talent. What did he do? He buried it in the ground. And what does the master do? The master says, you wicked and you lazy servant, right? Because he had a gift, but he wasn't willing to grind. And therefore, he didn't have the victory. He lost. He suffered loss. Your gift times grind equals victory. The work is equivalent to the win. The work is equivalent to the win. See, some people like the concept of winning, but they don't want the commitment. It takes effort to win. You are not going to be a victorious Christian, and we are not going to win at Easter time if we are not committed to the win, to do what it takes, to show up early, to set up chairs before the sunrise service, to come and to, to learn our music, to, to prepare mentally and to pray up and to, and, and to get ready, to dress nice and to iron this t-shirt that's all wrinkled up, right? See, it's going to take effort on our part. And Many people like the concept, I want to be a winner, and yet they're not willing to commit. But we need to aim, we need to focus on what we're valuing. He opened that window and he said, shoot, because there is a victory that's going to take place. And then he said, I want you to take some arrows and I want you to strike the ground. And he struck it three times. See, he only had three in him. He didn't have a five in him. He didn't have a six in him. He didn't have a seven in him. He didn't have an eight in him. But guess what, church? If we can put our hand around those arrows and we can start to strike the ground and we can 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 strike the ground. See, your gift times your grind will equal the victory you have. He said, you only struck three times. Now you're only going to defeat them three times. You should have struck five or six times because then you would have defeated them and wiped them out completely. Church, let's not leave anything on the table this Easter. If there's cards out there, my goodness, far be it from us to leave an invite card unhanded out. Far be it from us to leave a door hanger left on the table out there. Far be it from us to leave an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus and to invite him to church. Far be it from us. Because God has assignments on our life, and if we're going to win, we've got to commit to the win. Sometimes we think it's what I don't have. Well, I don't have the money. I don't have the talent. I don't have the insight. I don't have the wisdom that I need. Listen, guys, it's not what you don't have that causes you to lose. It's what you have and you don't use that causes you to lose. Back to the parable of the talents, right? Remember the guy that lost, why did he lose? Was it because of what he didn't have? No. It's because of what he had that he didn't use that caused him to lose. 
And it's the same way in our lives. We have the spirit of God. We have the mind of Christ. We have the influence and the favor and the anointing of God on our lives. And yet, if we don't use it, it's going to cause us to be defeated Christians. It's not what you don't have. It's not about money. Not about talent. Not about time. It's not about anything else. But it's about what you have that you don't use that causes you to lose. We've got to commit to the win. We've got to use every resource possible. We've got to use up our lives, our strength, our resources, our energies, our efforts, our prayers, because we're going to win. See, you don't mind working if you know that you're winning. Is that right? I can go all day long when I know I'm winning. My goodness. I remember playing games out, you know, we used to play street ball and all that kind of stuff. We used to play baseball, all that kind of thing. And, you know, if, if one team got on a, on a winning streak, man, they could just go. The other team's like, hey, it's getting late. And we're like, what? Just because we're winning, you want to stop? Well, we could play all day. Listen, the stars are going to come out. We'll still be playing this game. Why? Because when you're winning, you don't mind working. But if you don't feel like you're winning, you'll give up and quit. And so you need to know that you're on a winning team. You need to know that Jesus Christ already gathered up the victory for you. And now you are led in his procession. The Bible says he led captivity captive. You know what that means? That means Jesus spoiled the grave. Jesus went down and he gathered up all those saints that were waiting for him. And he's declared his victory to spirits in bondage. He said, hey, boys and girls, it's time to go up to my father because I have overcome. I lived the perfect, spotless, sinless life. And now I have overcome the devil. And he went up and he led captivity captive. There were captives in his train. And he came up and on his way up, I believe that he met the devil in the air. And he said, devil, it's time for you to hand over the keys to the kingdom because you may have taken them by deceit from Adam and Eve, but I have shown up and I have qualified and I am the last Adam. And now those keys are my keys. And guess what else? You no longer have any weapons and you're a little lion. And guess what? I'm going to pluck your teeth one by one. Why? Because you're going to be roaring. And the only people that are going to be defeated are the ones that lay down and say, all right, devil, go ahead and swallow me up. Devil's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. When Christians don't feel like they're winning, they just lay down, all right, devil, I guess that's just the way it is. I guess that, uh, you know, I'm not going to ever get over this. I guess I'm not winning, so I might as well just jump in. Open up wide, devil, I'm going to jump in. And yet God says, I pulled his teeth. He's just roaring because he has no bite. His bark is worse than his bite. You've got every tool that you need. You are a winner. You are on a winning team. You yourself have on the inside of you the greater one. Jesus Christ has been raised to life, and now he lives on the inside of you. You are a winner, and you have the capacity to win. And guess what? If you're in church, if you're doing something for Jesus, if you're moving on, if you're breathing as a Christian, come on, somebody, you are winning. we got to commit to the victory before the battle even begins. How do we do that? Well, you got to celebrate the win. you got to celebrate the win. Celebrate before you see. That's why we're having a rally beforehand. I need you guys to get a picture. I want you to just take a moment and look around the sanctuary for a second. Look at all the empty seats, okay? I want you to seriously crane your neck. Turn around right now. Come on, rubberneck it. Turn around and look at every empty seat. I want you to see something for a second with me. I don't want you to see empty seats. I want you to see every seat filled. I want you to look in those family rooms over there. I want you to see that stacked up. I want somebody to picture the the, the foyer out there. And I want you to see chairs lined up in front of the television screens, okay? I want you guys to, to get a picture of the courtyard. I want you to see every bench in the courtyard with people sitting down with their Bibles open. I want you to see every table out there at the plaza, every table filled with people with their Bibles. Bibles open. I want you to picture the Love Rock Cafe for a second. Okay, especially my SPTs who are in there a lot and my cafe workers who are in there a lot. I want you to see every table in the cafe filled with people with their Bibles open watching the screens, okay? I need you guys to see the youth ministry. I need you to see that whole youth auditorium. Come on, Pastor Richard. Come on, man. I need you to see that whole youth auditorium filled with teenagers, every teen in this place. I want you to picture it, okay? I want you to picture it bonkers. I want you to picture the altars filled. I want you to picture kids crying 
plan and given their lives to Jesus. Every child in this place pictures your children's ministry classroom, okay? Every children's worker. All right, Pastor Mono, Pastor Mike, Pastor Sue, Jamal, Jenny, come on, you guys. I need you guys to picture every classroom over there filled multiple times over. I want you to picture crazy. I want you to picture overwhelming. I want you to picture how we going to make it. Okay, come on. Somebody needs to get a picture of this on the inside of them. I need the SPTs in this place. I want you to picture yourself lined up and pressed up against the chairs because there's not enough room at the altar for all the people that are getting saved. I need you to picture this place filled. Come on, somebody. Picture this place filled with people who are getting on their knees and weeping and repenting of sin and giving their lives to Jesus Christ. Somebody needs to picture it by the Spirit of God. I need my parking lot attendants to picture every space in the parking lot, all up and down the street, across the street. I need the bus ministry to picture every bus filled to capacity and overflowing. Picture it. And now celebrate it. Somebody give the Lord a praise for what he's going to do at Easter. Somebody shout unto God with a voice of triumph. you got to celebrate it before you see it. Hallelujah. Don't take a day of victory and turn it into a defeat by focusing on what you didn't do. Well, we should have. Well, we could have. I wish. Man, if we would have only. Listen, celebrate the victory. Shout to God. Bless the Lord. I don't care what the devil throws at me come hell or high water. Guess what's going to happen? I'm going to praise the Lord because this is the day that the Lord has made. And I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus is alive. He's seated at the right hand of the Father interceding on my behalf. Jesus is still in the business of saving souls, changing lives. His spirit is alive on the inside of me. He's moving in this church. This church is not dying and growing old. We are growing this year. This is a year to grow. And we are going to grow at Easter. There's going to be people planted in this house because of what happens at Easter where's Reverend Tony Pastor Tony where's he at come on brother I need you to get a picture beyond Easter of every growth track every growth track I, I, I need you to just get that picture the next steps I need you to get a picture of the membership class. I need you to get, you get a picture of all the volunteers you're going to need, my brother. I need you to get a picture of just getting overwhelmed and oversaturated. And we're going to open up more rooms because there's not enough room for the people. I need you guys to get a picture of this right here in your heart, right here in your spirit. And I need you to celebrate it before you see it. Ask yourself this question. Am I a window or am I a wall? Am I showing people something or am I hiding something? Can Jesus and his vision for this church be seen in me? Or are people getting hung up on the outside on what I'm presenting? We all need to be windows. We need to create and communicate the wind. We need to speak it. Listen, God has given you a voice and he has given you a vehicle to say what God is doing. If you want to see something, you better say something. You better speak to your mountain and speak it until you see it. You better say something. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Start to declare God is moving in this church. Start to declare my ministry is filled up. Start to declare I have more than enough volunteers. Start to declare we've got more than enough salvations. Start to declare Jesus is discipling people here at the rock because there are people that are coming that are hungry and that they are thirsting for righteousness and we are ready and equipped to take care of them. Come on, you better speak to that mountain. You better start speaking to that situation. Start speaking to your life. Start speaking to your community. Start speaking. Somebody needs to stand up in this place and start to declare this place is filled in the name of Jesus. Listen, it can't just be me, guys. I'm not smart enough, talented enough. I will grind until I die. When I go to heaven, I'm going to crash in on E. There's going to be smoke piling out the back, and my car is going to look like a hoopty and be falling to pieces, and I'm going to step out and say, all right, Jesus, I'm ready for my mansion because I'm going to give it all. But guys, even though I'm going to give it all doesn't mean I can do it all. I need you. 
and you need me. We need each other. We are the body of Christ. We are interconnected. Jesus is our head. Somebody stand up and start to declare over this place. This place is filled at Easter. Start to declare over your ministry. The children are going to be encouraged. Come on, somebody. Start to lift up your voice and say it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Start to declare there's going to be salvations in this place at Easter. People are going to get saved. You've invited somebody. Start to speak. They're coming at Easter. They're going to come and they're going to give their heart and life to Jesus. Start to declare over your unsaved loved ones, your family members, your co-workers, your neighborhood. Start to declare. Start to say it. Start to speak it. Start to believe it and say it. Say it. Say it. If you want to see it, you got to say it. You got to speak. Come on. Now start to lift up a praise and celebrate the victory that God has given you in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. Woo. Leave the window open this Easter season. And let's declare the victory of the Lord. Father, we just receive your word tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, that we can see it. God, we can see the Inland Empire coming. God, we see traffic jams out there on Waterman and Caroline, God. We see, we see freeway traffic jams, God, out there on the 10 trying to get off to get to this place. Lord, Lord, we see so many people coming, God, that it's overwhelming. God, we, we see by the Spirit children, youth, young adults, adults, the elderly, God, coming. Lord, we see English, Spanish. We see every tribe, every tongue, every nation, black, white, brown. Native Americans, God. Pacific Islanders, Lord. Asians, God. We see them coming. God, we see these altars filled. Because the blood of Jesus has been shed for their lives. And Lord, we see your church not just having church, but being the church. We see tremendous growth. And we see the end of empire shall be saved.